and it's now reaching like a, a, a dystopian level to, to offer euthanasia as an alternative to people to, to addictions. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Today I'm joined by Jason Kenney. He's a Canadian Conservative politician and the former Minister of Defence in Canada, as well as being the former Minister for Immigration and Multiculturalism. We're going to be talking all about the state of Canada and conservatism in your country. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. And I'm impressed by your podcast and your interest in Canada. Actually, normally we're uh, ignored because people can think, think we're boring. But all of a sudden, you, you've identified Canada as a place of some excitement in uh, global political trends. But perhaps not for the right reasons. <laughs> and I want to talk about that. So. I made a documentary in Canada, which I encourage everyone to go and watch, um, and it's called Canada, um, a sort of warning to the West. Do you think that Canada is a warning to other Western countries in terms of excessive liberalism? Yes, increasingly so. Uh, and it wasn't always thus. Uh, we used to be called the peaceable kingdom. Uh, our The preamble to our constitution says that Canada is founded on the principles of peace, order, and good government. And I think when historically when most people think of Canada they think of a responsible the sort of elder daughter of the Commonwealth um, with an interesting twist which is bilingualism and historically we called it biculturalism between the French and the English um, we were also early adopters of a more formal kind of a version of British pluralism what we started calling multiculturalism in the 1960s but I would say that that uh, under the tenure of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau over the past eight years or so, in addition to seeds that were planted in the academy and the media and other uh, important cultural institutions, we now see Canada more or less in the vanguard of uh, many of the more destructive um, obsessions of, of the left. Whether it, and this is now seen in a huge increase in violent crime, often associated with an addictions crisis, I think being abetted by uh, well-intentioned but massively wrong-headed policies, uh, a crisis of identity in the country. We now, a recent poll this week showed a huge decline in attachment to and pride in the country amongst younger people, um, a housing crisis driven in part by, I believe, irresponsibly high levels of, of mass immigration, um, and uh, an economy in stagnation, so, and, and, and so much more so that, that you've been covering. So I do think it's, it, it's possible to say that Canada is a sort of warning law, sign uh, for other developed democracies in many respects. Why do you think that these policies have taken place in Canada in particular? Well, I, partly that you've had, okay, so the Liberal Party of Canada led by Justin Trudeau was historically a broad, centrist, pragmatic brokerage party. Uh, a, a large part of its historical base were uh, Catholics and immigrants who typically were uh, culturally re re reasonably conservative. You had a lot of what we call Bay Street, or you would hear in the saying this, you know, business corporate leaders that used to support the Liberal Party as well. So it was a pretty broad, uh, pragmatic par centrist party, not really a party with deep ideological obsessions. And in that way, it reflected the fairly moderate political culture of Canada, which has historically avoided extremes on the left and right. Um, but I would argue that, uh, and I, it's, it, I think it's too simplistic to, to locate all of this in, in one government or one premiership, but on the political side, um, Justin Trudeau, uh, I think, uh, took over that broad pragmatic centrist party and moved it to being a, a party of, uh, increasingly of the left, uh, on the spectrum of issues, but particularly on sort of questions of identity. Um, I mean, and a lot of what we have, you have happening in Canada is happening right across the developed world, certainly across the Anglosphere, right? And much of it emanating out of the academy. academy. I think you had, like in, in the late, in the early 1970s, a large number of, when universities were expanding, there were a lot of new people hired into faculties. Many of them were American draft dodgers, quite famously coming, avoiding the Vietnam War. Uh, and over the ensuing 20 years you, you, or so, you had, I think, old school liberal academics increasingly hiring into their faculties uh, younger scholars who were coming from critical uh, studies, uh, who were increasingly focused on um, aspects of what, you know, of Frankfurt School Marxism, what some call uh, cultural Marxism. 
And increasingly, the, the, this, this went across the spectrum of the, of the humanities and the social sciences and now into other disciplines, where, where uh, particularly in faculties of education. So I, I think, you know, you had this, this gr gradual capture of uh, institutions of education by this uh, increasingly aggressive uh, uh, left-wing uh, uh, corner of the academy. And all of these, th these things mixed together have created the kind of momentum that you see now. Do you think that Canadian identity has been taken over by this kind of woke or sort of left-wing ideology? And do you think that's historically because Canadian identity has been fairly weak compared to other nations? So obviously Canada is a yeah. part of the Commonwealth and, and has a sort of uh, past in, in British, right. um, in the British Empire and sort of in British colonial rule. And perhaps there are some people who argue that because of this sort of weak national foundation or national story, um, Canada's identity was able to be taken over by these kind of left-wing ideologues. Well, I think you can make that argument. I think it's a little more complex, complex than that. But uh, look, in the vast spectrum of the history of the British Empire, Canada was uh, a unique experiment in some respects. The Quebec Act of the British Parliament in the mid-18th uh, century effectively gave to the French Catholics, the former um, uh, colonists of, 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 of New France, it gave to them the, the privilege of maintain, the right to maintain uh, their Catholic French institutions, schools, hospitals, the role of the church in, in civil society, civil law, etc. And so it, it created, in, it, we ended up creating a, a confederation based on that uh, expression of, of French Catholic culture in North America alongside a more traditional sort of uh, British uh, colony with, of course, our indigenous peoples and First Nations and, 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 all of, and then an, an openness to immigration in order to settle the, the West, all of which led to, a, I think, a very admirable, relaxed kind of a, a British uh, Canadian pluralism. And we were able to reconcile those differences w without worrying about it too much. And so we didn't force identity questions too hard. Um, I'll, I'll, but I would say that, that this led to perhaps a bit of a, what happened in the post-war period, especially in the 60s, is that a lot of English Canadian nationalists said, we can no longer define ourselves in historical terms with, re with reference to the British Empire, British institutions and symbols. We need to carve out our own Canadian identity. Meanwhile, in, in, in French Canada, you had the separatist movement and in a, depthening, a, a, a deepening of national identity, um, a, a very conscious project to protect the French language and to be proud of, of French Canadian history. So we started to take a kind of two different uh, approaches. And um, and so now, yes, we, we I guess because Justin Trudeau famously said or infamously said, uh, the year he became prime minister, that uh, Canada is the fir world's first post-national state. We have no national identity. But since then, he has effectively also accused the country of not only historical, but active and current genocide. He lowered our country's flag at all federal institutions for uh, over half a year as an expression of uh, collective guilt. Um, for some of the injustices that happened to First Nations people. So is it, would it, is it at all surprising that we now see reflected in current polling a dramatic drop in, it, in attachment to and, and pride in the country? I, I don't think so. You talk about the Quebec Act, just interesting thing about that, of course, that led to uh, some American right. revolutionaries uh, leading, <laughs> leading to the formation of it's the United true. States. Um, in, in fact, the, I would say the fairly enlightened British approach, both to, in, in historical terms, in historical context, to um, the preservation of French Catholic institutions, um, but also the uh, the Royal Proclamation, which, in an historical context, was far more generous towards Indigenous people than what the Americans were doing uh, south of the border. So the the, the U.S. The, the American Revolution was prompted in part by what they saw as a excessive British generosity towards. Uh, those uh, ethnic, uh, those racial minorities to, uh, the, in the, the First Nations, Indigenous people, and also uh, Quebecers. So, and Canada was also, I mean, so Canada was founded by refugees from the American Revolution, right? Who, who, who were willing to embrace those things. And, uh, and, and um, unsurprisingly, we were also the North Star, uh, the Underground Railroad for escaped slaves um, who came from uh, the American colonies.
So I think in, in, in many respects, there's so much to be proud of, even from a, I mean, like a liberal perspective of the role that Canada played in, uh, in, in, our, uh, in our history uh, as a place of pluralism protect, and respect for human dignity. Also, Imperfectly. There's also a, a misconception, I think, about Canada as being this very historically polite and almost soft nation in a way, whereas the original Canadians, they were some of the toughest yeah. frontier men that you could have. Yeah. And of course, um, one of the great Canadian heroes, I think, is John A. Macdonald, your first prime minister. And, and when we made this documentary in Canada over the summer, we went to his statue in Toronto, which has been boarded up for fear of uh, being attacked and perhaps the statue will even be uh, removed. The decision hasn't been made yet. So I just want, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about these kind of attacks on Canadian history and particularly these attacks on Canada's past connection with, with Britain and the British Empire. What do you think is the impact of that? Yeah, well, look, obviously the, the, the more virulent and recent expressions of this are um, informed by the increasingly zealous academic, academic obsession with anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, critical race theory, intersectionality, all uh, stirred together in the, in the what, stew of what we call wokeism. Um, and it's an unapologetic effort to efface uh, much of our history. I'll will, I will say there's a certain selectivity being applied, which suggests actually, at some level, this is almost a partisan project. For example, John MacDonald, there's absolutely no question. Without John McDonald, there'd be no Canada. Uh, and his liberal, uh, most recent biographer of John McDonald, Richard Gwynne, was a fan of Pierre Trudeau. He was very much a liberal in academic and, and journalist. And he says, no, uh, McDonald, no Canada. He was a guy who took the, this, you know, the warring factions of the orange and green Irish, of, of, of Protestants and Catholics, of French and, and British, of the, the, the First Nations, and somehow carved this huge, vast country under pressure from American aggression across North America. It was a one of the great achievements of statesmanship of the 19th century. And at, we can uh, acknowledge that and honor his central role in our founding, uh, while at the same time recognizing that obviously in uh, in historical retrospect, uh, there were great injustices and, and prejudices of that time, including prejudices towards indigenous people, which did lead to injustice. And we, and we have to be frank about that. My view as a conservative is that uh, we have to both celebrate what's best about our history, but also be clear-minded about what's worst in it. But it, it, it seems that the, that the huge push from... Uh, the cultural left is to is uh, is to look at Canada as an unmit and and this is kind of a theme almost amplified by Prime Minister Trudeau uh, to look at our history as one of a, almost unmitigated and gross injustice or as he would say genocide um, and you know, you know as I say this is applied selectively for example the first French Canadian Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Um, who was a great liberal prime minister. In fact, the, the major donor club of Justin Trudeau's liberal party is called the Laurier Club to this day. He massively expanded the Indian residential school system. He signed an order in council banning blacks from migrating to Canada. He brought in the continuous journey policy that effectively made it impossible for South Asians to immigrate to Canada, uh, leading to the Komagato Maru incident. He um, increased by tenfold the Chinese head tax, which was a bigoted anti-Chinese immigration policy. And somehow his statues are standing all across the country. So I do think there is a kind of selectivity in it. And this is the, one of the problems with this kind of historical revisionism. It's never applied consistently. Not that it should be, it, in, in terms of the cancel culture. We're currently at ARC uh, in Greenwich in London. And just a couple of miles away in Greenwich Park, there is a statue to, a, I think, a great Canadian hero, James Wolfe, um, who, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but who won his brilliant battles in Quebec. But um, uh, just that was just a side note. Um, I, I want to ask about uh, Christianity in Canada. And I know that um, you know, there are some people who say Canada has become a real sort of post-Christian nation. Do you agree with that thesis? Well, yes. I, I, I mean, I think that's a fair uh, diagnosis of most Western countries uh, with deep Christian histories. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're down to, I think, uh, something like 15% uh, weekly church attendance. Um, a majority of the population still 
registers as as Christian, and and so you know there's still that sort of uh, uh, attenuated cultural influence of a much more robust Christian society in the past, um, and um, I, I would say that uh, you know this is particularly the case in Quebec, uh, in Quebec, which was seventy years ago a deeply Catholic. A historically agrarian society where the church was embedded in every institution. Uh, Quebec in the mid 1960s went through a period called the Quiet Revolution, where um, essentially a n- new secular nationalist government uh, said that 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 the church should be removed from the administration of mo- the, the schools and and hospitals, and welfare programs, and so on. The same time you had modern communications and lots of demographic changes, urbanization, and it almost overnight, you had a, a perhaps the single fastest uh, secularization of a, a society in, in, in the modern era, and so um, it, and so now uh, young Quebecers have very little historical memory of or even connection to uh, to that past, which is. Which I, you know, it's challenging because it's hard to identify French, Canadian, or Quebec history and identity out of that out of that historical Catholic context. You talk about Quebec. Uh, let's talk about Alberta. You were the premier of Alberta during the coronavirus pandemic, and just sticking on this theme of Christianity, there were some videos during the coronavirus lockdowns of priests in Alberta um, coming up against the law because of uh, lockdown restrictions in churches. Do you have any regrets as the premier of, premier of Alberta in terms of those lockdown policies and how it impacted the church? Well, actually, uh, Alberta was ha- had the l- lightest restrictions of any province, and that would be, I think, universally acknowledged. I was the premier at the time and widely condemned by most of the mainstream media and my political adversaries for being, uh, they would claim, recklessly liberal on uh, COVID restrictions. We were the only province uh, to allow for uh, congregational worship to continue throughout the entire pandemic. Some other provinces shut all places of worship for uh, for months at a time. Um, and we were in constant communication with faith leaders about how to get it right. Um, so, I, so no, I don't regret the policies that we had because we have a, in our, in our um, single-payer healthcare system a, a ration system with very limited capacity. And we came a couple of times perilously close uh, to having to triage patients, deny people care, withdraw care from others. Um, And we did at times have to cancel half or more of the surgeries to repurpose surgical staff into intensive care. Um, And so uh, I found the vast majority of Christian and other faith leaders understood that we had to be uh, prudent and they, it was very obvious that I was was uh, struggling with the, uh, how to do that with the, the limited damage of restrictions. In, a, in I think, two or three instances, there were uh, pastors, not priests, but in, I think all, all of them were evangelical, uh, independent evangelical pastors, who very flagrantly, publicly, repeatedly for months refused any uh, communication with the uh, public health authorities and, and just ignored all of the, the measures. No, you know, they just told the people not to wear masks and to jam in next to each other and so forth. And eventually, uh, the, the, the enforcement authorities to, got court injunctions against those two or three churches. I do regret that all of that happened, but I, if they had acted more, I think, in my perspective, more responsibly, it could have been avoided. Do you think that Canadian Conservatives in general have been too weak in pushing back against this excessive liberalism, not just over the last few years, but I mean, going back sort of decades? Uh, yeah, I think in retrospect, that's you could make that argument. Although there have been, you know, when I was um, minister of citizenship, immigration, and, and multiculturalism, I very clearly tried to change the 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 debate to focus on a a, a kind of a positive approach to pluralism, where people can have a, a healthy pride in their cultural antecedents, their 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 faith and, and customs. While becoming fully Canadian, I always used to. I used to quote David Cameron saying that that uh, newcomers have a. Oh, sorry, Tony Blair. Excuse me. I better cut that one. In. <laughs> They're I, very similar people. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to quote Tony Blair saying that um, the well, the host society has a 
duty to be welcoming and newcomers have a duty to integrate. Um, and there's all sorts of ways I express that in policy, including uh, uh, increasing the duration at, required for people to get citizenship, increasing the threshold for civic literacy, a much clearer presentation of Canadian identity and history in our st citizenship test. Uh, we changed the multiculturalism program to focus on building bridges and advance uh, promoting civic literacy uh, and, and integration into Canada. We did a lot of practical things. I was, I was widely criticized by, by many on the left for these things. Um, but the problem is in, when, you're, when you're focused on the political side, it, it, there's always going to be a change of government. And any policies like these can, can and in this case, were reversed by the Trudeau government. So I, I'm a strong believer in the premise that politics is downstream of culture. And if you want to have an enduring effect on counteracting some of these more radical trends, it has to come from, before it becomes political, it has to come from cultural institutions. And I think that's where conservative-minded people, or just mainstream people broadly, haven't understood the stakes. I'll give you an example. In our, we have these local school boards elected across Canada. Typically, the turnout, the voter participation is like 15, certainly under 20%. Well, it, it, it just so happens that that the teachers' unions and their ideological allies completely dominate these elections and are, you know, radically removed from the sort of centrist uh, political consensus in Canada. So I, I would say if, if, we, if, you, if you want to reverse some of the, the, these more extreme trends, it's going to require um, severely normal middle-class families actually getting engaged at the local level in, um, in local decision-making. Around the world, conservative movements have changed, and I would say that um, conservatism as a sort of mainstream philosophy across Western uh, countries and across political parties uh, in the West um, has become more radical in recent years, particularly in response to some of the kind of woke revolutionaries that we've seen and some of the woke policies, etc. And, and, and that's obviously happened in Canada, as you said, um, to a large extent. Do you think that Canadian conservatives have adapted to this new era of conservatism? Uh, no, I think they're still struggling. But look, on the political level, uh, responsible political leaders have to deal with the imminent priorities of, of the broad public. And right now in Canada, that's cost of living, it's housing, it's a bundle of very practical issues. My uh, former intern, a conservative leader, uh, Pierre Polyev is doing a very good job of that. And by the way, I think it actually, I mean, my, here's my point. Engaging in in sort of theoretical, ideological uh, struggle is not a path to government. Uh, you have to focus, and I think Stephen Harper uh, was brilliant at this, you have to focus on concrete concerns of, 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 uh, of regular people and their aspirations. It just so happens that what Pierre Polyev is focused on cost of living, housing, et cetera. Much of it comes, is the, the problem is the consequence of unrealistic ideological zeal by uh, Trudeau and the left. For example, bidding up the price of, of energy in an energy rich and abundant country. We have the third largest oil reserves in the world, the fifth largest natural gas reserves. He, he effectively is, has a series of policies trying to massively constrain those industries to make energy massively more expensive for people in an energy-rich country it makes no sense so but the way to win that debate isn't i think on on the level of, of, of political theory it's it's by focusing on the concrete costs to to destructive policies like that on the question of uh, for example um uh, legitimization of of dangerous drug addictions and this uh, what started as a well-intentioned focus on, on, on so-called harm reduction is is now transformed into the gov agents of the government actually handing out a dangerous, illicit, toxic dr uh, drugs to people. And now, now that that's affecting the mainstream population in terms of violent crime and social disorder in many of our cities, that's become a retail political issue. So I, I think I think um, leaders are right to focus on uh, how these problems intersect with the lives of regular people. I think you're you're so right on that, but 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 also at the same time, um, these culture wars are going on within many institutions, and as we talked about, Canadian history, for example, is under attack. And if one completely ignores this, then the other side simply wins. No, I agree. I agree. Um, and, and one issue I want to mention specifically about um, where perhaps Canadian conservatives, I think. Um, have, have kind of uh, dropped the ball, 
is on so-called um, kind of gender transitioning, uh, gender conversion therapy. And there was a Bill C-4 in the Canadian Parliament that many Conservatives voted for that banned gender conversion therapy for so-called gender identities. In other words, it, it might have banned parents telling their children, you're not trans, although you may think you are, um, you're actually just you're just gay or, or you're confused or you have gender dysphoria. So that's one issue where it just seems so odd to me that the Conservative, uh, Conservative MPs in the Canadian Parliament would, would vote in favour of that bill. Uh, do you agree with me that that's perhaps a, a, a kind of blind spot in a Pierre Polyev's Conservative Party on this transgender issue? Well, more recently, uh, he expressed support for the uh, concerns raised by parents in a series of large protests across, across the country uh, that at the very least parents have a right to know uh, what's going on in the most critical decisions of their children's lives uh, because we have a, a and the, by the, look I can only refer to my own um, re record on these issues uh, I succeeded a, a socialist government in Alberta NDP government that had made it illegal for schools to communicate with parents on these issues and I ran on a platform to repeal this. Now, I, I, they said I would, that my policy of communicating with parents if their children were going through some gender dysphoria or another identity crisis was somehow going to kill children. I mean, they accused, they accused me of, 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 of purposefully wanting um, children, gender diverse children to die. This is, and of course, so we changed the law. There hasn't, there hasn't been any negative consequence from that. So I do think, you know, and by the way, there were people in my own campaign, in my own party, that came to me and said, you are, you're being politically reckless, uh, you're risking our election by uh, taking such a apparently strident position of informing parents, of, being, of allowing teachers to inform parents about some of these issues. Um, you have to reverse course on this. I refuse to do so. And we won the largest number of votes in Alberta political history. So I, I do think that, that political leaders need, you, on issues like this, th these are difficult, emotionally wrought issues. You have to be, you have to be clear about what your motive is. You have to be deliberate and careful, but you can also be courageous in standing up to the mob of, of, of the left, which is, is trying in this instance to completely disempower parents fr from critical decisions affecting their kids. Politics is one thing, but morality is surely more important. And if, if an issue is right or wrong, then that's, that's, that, that's what matters, I suppose. And I know that um, as a politician, you have to take into account all of these different considerations in terms of strategy, etc. But on this issue of, of such an important issue of, of parental rights, of, um, of allowing children to be able to, or allowing parents to have proper communication with their parents, I think, um, I think it just seems to me that's a really clear-cut issue and, and nothing else matters, but I, I don't know. And it's interesting, in the Canadian context, as you've seen, there's this huge multi-ethnic coalition building on this because immigrant, uh, broadly speaking, immigrant parents, one thing they're not going to sacrifice is um, their responsibility for their kids. And this is something so interesting. We interviewed a Sikh guy, a uh, Sikh family, actually, in this documentary we made in, in Canada, and he was very much against what he described as the militarization of the sexualization of children in Canada. And he described, for example, he has an eight-year-old son who was told that he should dress up in the opposite gender's clothing for some sort of drag day in school. And he took the um, kid out of school and he told us, look, they, the, the school likes to promote uh, my multicultural background when they're talking right. about South Asian Heritage Day and they like me making curries. But when I say uh, my opinions on important issues of LGBT rights, for example, they don't want to listen to me, you know, and, and it's a very, con and suddenly he's become a kind of outcast in the school among many parents and, and, and teachers and, and things like this. And so perhaps there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting phenomenon, isn't there? That well, some, my, I, I've always, some, yeah. authentic pluralism is, a, is, has to include respect for a diversity of belief, not just sort of the external trappings of uh, cultural diversity. And increasingly, I think we see on the left a total intolerance for a diversity of belief. I want to talk about multiculturalism, and this is such an interesting topic, particularly today after the protests we've seen across the Western world, but particularly in Canada, uh, pro-Palestinian protests following uh, this terrible uh, murder of Jews uh, in Israel by Hamas. Do you think that that is a, uh, a sign that multiculturalism in Canada is failing? I would say that it's, um, it's a, not necessarily, I don't, 
look at this as a multicultural issue. You can look at the, these the crowds and, well, two weeks ago I was walking into a national conference on anti-Semitism that was planned long before the Hamas atrocities. And uh, as I was approaching the doors of the Ottawa Congress Center, a, a small group of protesters saw me coming. They banded together, blocked the doors, locked arms, and wouldn't let me come in. Um, and I scanned the, the group. They all looked to me like pretty typical middle-class Caucasian Canadian kids whose minds undoubtedly had been poisoned by the uh, this d d d obsessive and distorted um, uh, obsession with anti-colonial, anti-imperialism, critical race theory at, at whatever universities they go to. So that's not about multiculturalism. Uh, that's about a totally different challenge, which is that this this capture of entire sections of the academy, uh, which are effectively indoctrinating large numbers of young people of all backgrounds, of all cultural and ethnic backgrounds, into this ideology. So you, I would say, like in London here, uh, a very substantial portion of those crowds who are uh, energetically anti-Israel um, are, um, well, they're very diverse crowds and they include people whose families have been in Canada or Britain for centuries. But undoubtedly, many of these protesters, some of which are outrightly pro-Hamas, right. come from um, Muslim countries, come from Muslim backgrounds, and I think that many Canadians, and, and particularly in Britain, I'm talking about the British context here, um, would say that this is something at a little bit to do with multiculturalism because we've imported many, many people who support a terrorist organization, and that is Hamas. And in France, for example, the French Minister of the Interior has talked about deporting people who support this organization who aren't French citizens. Do you think that that could be a policy that Canada could adopt? Well, I was a member of a government that... Uh, adopted a, a policy of uh, revoking citizenship uh, from uh, dual nationals who had uh, been convicted of engaging in, in terrorism. And that would include, for example, fundraising for terrorist organizations. Um, we also, the Harper government brought in a law uh, that's been repealed uh, to ban glorification of, ter of terrorism. Uh, we, and I think some of the elements of some of these protests would ser clearly meet that legal threshold of glorifying Hamas. Um, <clears throat> but interesting English note, uh, British note, when I was Minister of, uh, of Citizenship and Immigration, um, I refused to grant a ministerial permit to allow the admission into Canada of George Galloway uh, because he had handed tens of thousands of euros in cash to Ismail Haniya in Gaza City. Uh, and it was thereby funding a banned terrorist entity. I also wrote into the Citizenship Guide of Canada that, that Canada's tolerance and diversity do, does not extend uh, to supporting uh, violent foreign conflict. So I think there's all sorts of things that can and must be done by Western societies to lay out uh, clear markers. Let's, but let's it, look, look, the reality is there is a, a, a real dynamic tension between legitimate freedom of expression and crossing the line into actually supporting uh, illicit terrorism. And let's not pretend that's an easy line uh, to draw. In some cases, people are straddling the fence on that, aren't they? Do you think that some people are impossible to integrate into Canadian society? I, well, I think that in any society, there are people who are going to uh, uh, commit uh, crimes uh, and, and uh, they should be held accountable regardless of their... Um, but I'm not talking about crimes necessarily, but in terms of Canadian culture and supporting Canadian values and um, becoming a Canadian in that sense, they might not necessarily have to be a criminal uh, to not be able to become a Canadian, if you see what yeah. I mean. Well, I, I would say, look, um, integration rarely happens uh, upon arrival. But, but the vast majority of people, like integration is a process. Uh, the vast majority of people who come to Canada do not come there in order just to reconstruct their country of origin. They come to become Canadian. And they know, perhaps just implicitly and intuitively, that they're coming to a country with a certain set of values, historically grounded institutions and customs, that have made it a desirable place in which to live. Uh, a tradition of ordered liberty, of, of, of a rule of law, parliamentary government, of property rights, of a free market. So I think the vast majority of people 
uh, want to be a part of that. They, they're eager. I can tell you, for example, if you look at the, uh, the cadets, which are the, uh, the um, programs for teenagers to, do, uh, to join auxiliaries of the various branches of the military, do community service and wear uniforms and learn military drill, overwhelmingly, I would say well over two-thirds of them, are the children of immigrants as an expression of their of their patriotism for the new country. So I think that's the vast majority, but but you know I think all through our history there have been a minority who uh, are are perhaps much more reluctant. I have to hasten to add this is not entirely a new problem. The number one challenge in in um, English Canada in much of the 19th century was Irish Catholics versus uh, Irish loyalists fighting out the old country struggle on the streets of Toronto and the, and the, uh, the farm towns of, of Upper Canada. So uh, th- th- these are not entirely new challenges. No, and, and uh, as you say, there have been inter-ethnic conflicts throughout history among different groups. And in the UK, I don't know about the Canadian context more recently, but in the UK and Leicester, there have been race riots between um, the kind of Hindus and the Muslims from uh, Pakistan and India. Uh, again, bringing those conflicts from their countries into Britain, and I think that's an example, again, of where multiculturalism hasn't worked and those people haven't integrated into British society. And, and I know at the beginning of this interview you said that immigration into Canada is too high. You think the numbers are too high. Why do you think that? Because we, simp- well, just on a very practical level, we don't have housing for people, let alone sufficient space in, in the healthcare system for effectively 1.5 million people a year on a population of 38 or 40 million. Um, so it's not an issue of integration, it's an issue of economics. Well, I also think, look, my view is, and I said this for five years as Canada's Minister of Immigration, that we're an open and welcoming country. We're hap- I'm glad that we have a broadly pro-immigration political consensus, but we can't take that for granted. We need the, so public support for immigration, including amongst immigrants, is predicated on immigration working for the country and for newcomers. And by which I mean that uh, the successful social and economic integration of, of folks. And um, and so, you know, the, the, they now have an tar- annual target of half a million permanent residents, but that obscures the fact that there are close to another million uh, uh, temporary foreign workers and, and foreign students coming. In the midst of a housing crisis and a, a, a crisis of access to our, uh, our health care system, um, it's, I think it's irresponsible uh, to, be, to be, uh, maintain those, those levels. And I say this as somebody who, who in any other country would be considered as somebody who supports fairly high level, levels of immigration. So I think they're risking the pro-immigration consensus. And yes, integration is, is one of these factors. It, 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 one of the concerning uh, issues I think we have, if we're, if we're honest in Canada, is, uh, is, is deepening uh, ethnic enclaves. That is to say, people who tending to move into neighborhoods with, with, with largely with populations from the same country or region of origin. And my concern is that that actually can can end up. There's a lot of social support in that. There's some good aspects in it. There's social capital, and people you know get practical support, employment, housing, with relatives and friends. But uh, it can also retard the uh, linguistic and economic, and then social integration of of, of of people. I mean, if you're a kid whose parents have immigrated from mainland China, and you're going to a school where 90 percent or more of your classmates have Mandarin as their first language. I suspect it's going to take you longer to learn English, and that may hold you back in in, in, in the economy. So these are things we need to be willing to discuss um, openly, but there really isn't a debate like that in Canada. But also for the Canadians who are already there, if your children are sudden, are in that 10% of people who don't speak Chinese or aren't from a Chinese background, that can also cause um, uh, tensions and problems. And I think, again, we've seen that in Britain where, you know, whole communities have been taken over by um, people from other cultures and other backgrounds, and um, they've suddenly become a minority in their own area. In term, as a, and I think that, that can cause uh, uh, ethnic problems and uh, tensions, and it has, um, undoubtedly, I think. Do you think that diversity is a strength? I think it uh, can be, but it, 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 just reciting that, <laughs> you know, that bromide diversity is our greatest strength, um, I think, I think missed the point. I think our greatest strength uh, in societies like the United Kingdom and Canada is our tradition of ordered liberty. Uh, diversity is a 
product of that. People want to come to our countries um, because of the historically grounded institutions, customs, and principles that we that that we, we we're blessed to have. And so, I mean, I, I I don't think we should turn diversity into this kind of this sort of uh, cult. I think we should celebrate the positive aspects of it. Recognize that. In increasingly diverse societies, there are also going to be tensions and challenges. It's not, it's, it's, it shouldn't be verboten to talk openly about those, those, those challenges. Um, but, uh, you, you know, at the, at the, we should also, like, I, I don't like to overstate those challenges because, broadly speaking, these are pretty successful societies. Um, and uh, we need to be intentional about, uh, intentional about keeping it that way. Donald Trump is obviously back on the political scene in America, in uh, Canada's southern neighbour, and he has become a political phenomenon over there. How do Canadian Conservatives deal with Donald Trump? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, first of all, just on a very practical issue, he's a huge protectionist and our economies are so integrated that's a constant a challenge and threat to us. Tearing up NAFTA was an existential threat to our economy, for example, and we finally negotiated uh, uh, a, a second version of it with minor changes. Um, it also creates for any uh, of America's friends a, a, a kind of unpredictability in uh, international affairs and in, in strategic and defense policy, for example. Uh, but as a conservative, um, my own view on this is that his brand of uh, weaponizing populist anger with no kind of governing conservative principles that are discernible to me is is toxic and poses a, an existential threat uh, to anything that could properly be called the conservative movement. Um, I think much of his appeal to people is not based on any uh, 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 policies or, or principles per se, but on a kind of um, on 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 the stylistic approach of Donald Trump as a his willingness to be vulgar and insult the cultural elites, the cultural and uh, political and economic elites, uh, which a large uh, segment of the Republican electorate uh, so deeply despises. I don't think. That is a, uh, you know, I, I, I think if that becomes the face of conservatism uh, in the Western world, then it's a movement that does not deserve to be in government. I, I think it's massively destructive. It has nothing to do with the sort of Burkean conception of, um, main, of, of learning from the past, preserving what's best about our institutions and customs. It's all about burning things down to, as he says, I am your revenge. You know, anger and revenge do not constitute uh, an appealing uh, political vision, in my view. Do you worry about populism? I, I worry about the more extreme versions of it like that. I mean, I've been called a populist uh, in the Canadian context, but uh, that by, by which I think my opponents mean I was I'm simply willing to give space to the anxieties of ordinary people against the elite consensus on things like carbon taxes, for example, or aspects of the debate around integration. So I do think that that that, that a, uh, a marriage uh, uh, can be found between sort of traditional conservatism and aspects of populism. Um, but uh, I think Trump represents something else altogether. I want to end the interview by talking about Canada's euthanasia laws. This was another topic that we uh, explored in our documentary in Canada. Uh, in Canada, they call them MAID laws, right? So sort of medical right, assisted right. and dying. Um, do you think that those expansion, the expansion of those laws to include mental illness as a category next year for people to be able to uh, have assisted suicide, is that a concern for you? Deeply. Uh, I helped to, to lead the fight against the legalization of euthanasia in Canada it, for over 20 years in Parliament. We successfully voted down during that time several private members' bills to legalize it. And uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, which was massively empowered by the Charter of Rights in 1982, upheld the, uh, the law against you know, banning uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia 15 years ago. But at the end of the Harper government eight years ago, they did a complete inversion on that decision and essentially imposed it on Parliament. 
And ever since, um, the Trudeau government has sought increasingly to widen the statutory uh, provisions for so-called medical assistance in dying. And it's now reaching like a, a, a dystopian level. I, it's a, I used, we used to point to the excesses in Belgium and Holland as a cautionary tale, but it's now Canada that's become that with a, a pending expansion of the law to allow for so-called mature minors, which implies uh, without parental consent and uh, for people with mental illness, and now to people with drug addictions. So literally, the, the policy direction is uh, is to euthanize, uh, to, to offer euthanasia as an alternative to people to, to, to addictions. It, it's, it's reached such a, a disgusting point that we had uh, veterans seeking service from the Veterans Affairs Department calling up frustrated caseworkers who would say, have you ever considered applying for medical assistance and dying? Veterans being referred by state bureaucrats uh, to euthanasia. Uh, 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 to, to, to quote, solve their their case challenges. Hey, this is, uh, it, it really, I think of all of the excesses of the Trudeau era, this is the most abhorrent. We interviewed Christine Galtier, the, the veteran, uh, you mentioned uh, her case, um, where she was asking for a disabled ramp in her home in, in Montreal, and, and the, the, the case worker said, have you considered uh, made, or basically, have you considered killing yourself? How... How uh, how do Cana- how is that happening in Canada? I mean, I just don't understand. It seems so immoral to me. Is it, is it a Trudeau thing or is it a broader? You know, th- th- there's always been a, f- a fairly high level of public support. Even when we were voting it down in Parliament, uh, I must admit there was a fairly high level of public support for the principle of, of medical assistance in dying that was d- that, the peop- that, that was supposed to be narrowly circumscribed. And I, I think that's just a, a reflection of sort of the modern liberal priority on personal autonomy and people's fear that they might end up in a uh, with ir- irremediable pain. Uh, I think part of the problem here is that the, the medical community and other leaders have been have done a poor job of describing the huge advances in palliative care and the ability to die, yes, with dignity, um, with appropriate medical support. So I think governments need massively to increase support for and, and awareness of the the life-giving option of palliative care. Um, but I don't think any Canadians, real, or very few, thought they were signing up for euthanizing children, minors, drug addicts, uh, and this kind of... It, it's now, what is it, I think the third lo- highest uh, um, cause of, of, of death in I think five percent of all deaths were from uh, medical so I, I really I, I really don't think this is what that 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 broad public that was concerned about extreme cases were, were thought they were signing up for several years ago. you you describe the policy as dystopian again do you link this to Canada's the decline in Christianity in Canada or is it something is it secularism that's that's caused this yeah, yeah uh, it, it obviously uh, the prioritization of radical personal autonomy over um, a conception of the human being as, as having possessing an inviolable dignity created in the image of God, which is common to at least all the Abrahamic faiths. I, I think that's a, that's a common spiritual and uh, trend it has, which has moral and then therefore policy consequences. Um, I, I, but I wouldn't just situate this in, in Christian terms because you know there are there as our country becomes as Canada becomes more diverse, there are people from all of the different growing faith traditions who have serious moral uh, concerns about this. Um, one last topic I want to ask about is in Canada there's no uh, abortion laws and again this is also being criticized by uh, by many socially conservative Canadians uh, including Maxime Bernier, uh, leader of, um, uh, of a party in Canada who's, uh, and, and, and some Christians as well. So wh- what do you make of this? It's quite excessive the, the fact that Canada has no, um, no laws uh, regulating abortion. There is a misconception that that's the result of uh, a Supreme Court decision when, in fact, uh, the court decision on this in 1988 <clears throat> openly invited Parliament uh, to come back with some parameters. Um, and there were a couple of failed efforts to do so in the late 1980s. Um, uh, look, I, I, I was very open in my 25 years in public life about my pro-life uh, conviction. And it, it, it does concern me that, that Canada is, I believe, the only Western democracy with no uh, effort in law to assign any value at any stage um, to, the, to the lives of unborn children. Uh, 
And it, it, this is, I mean, given that we, we are, are Canada historically was a place of sort of political moderation on certain issues like this, our actual uh, policy setting has been objectively immoderate. <laughs> it, we've been well, a, an out, a huge outlier, I would say, in, in the democratic world. Here in Europe, most countries have limits around 12 or, or, or 16 weeks and, and, and for different conditions, recognizing, maybe not my view, that there's uh, a, a, about the inviolable sanctity of, of, of the human person at all stages, but, but certainly recognizing there's some state interest in, in protecting uh, vulnerable unborn human life. Um, and yet it's become almost impossible to have that, that debate in the Canadian context. I mean, anytime somebody in Parliament even brings up a bill, for example, to make it a criminal penalty to assault a woman with the intention of harming their unborn child or, or compelling a woman to have an abortion, even these uh, bills uh, that have been proposed have been massively mischaracterized by, uh, by the Trudeau liberals and many in the media. So it's become almost impossible to have a, a kind of debate which is normal in Westminster or in France or in Scandinavia for that matter. What do you think that says about the state of Canadian morality? I, I think it, 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 it says that there's... That, that, We've gone from, from a country with a, a, a political culture of consensus and moderation uh, to one where uh, th there are certain issues that have been completely read out of democratic uh, debate. And I, and I don't think that's, I, I, I think at one level that's profoundly illiberal, actually. Thank you very much, Jason Kenny, for joining us. Really Cheers. appreciate your time.